Just ahead on American Black Journal, Detroit gets ready to welcome a new museum dedicated to the country's first black-owned and operated television station, plus details on a new effort to strengthen the relationship between fathers and their children. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts now. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. More than 40 years ago, the country's first African-American owned and operated television station went on the air right here in Detroit. And now the building that housed WGPR Channel 62 is reopening as a state-of-the-art museum. The William V. Banks Broadcast Museum and Media Center is going to pay tribute to the historic achievements of the TV station on East Jefferson, founded by Dr. Banks. The museum will feature WGPR program footage, memorabilia, and photos of on-air personalities and staff. There will be interactive video exhibits, and a portion of the museum is dedicated to the growth of African-American media owners around the country. Here's an example of what visitors will experience. The year is 1970, and the first issue of Black Enterprise rolls off the press, a publication that will become the centerpiece of black business journalism and commerce. While a number of other black-owned publications are already in existence, this magazine will forge new directions as an unprecedented business resource for African Americans. It quickly gains prominence as the first publication ever devoted to African-American entrepreneurs and corporate executives with a circulation of over a half a million and a readership of nearly four million. Its founder, Earl Graves Sr., is a true visionary who with his sons went on to expand the publication's reach into the digital and broadcast media as well as live events. He will also be named one of the 50 most powerful and influential African-Americans in corporate America by Fortune magazine. Not bad for the kid born and raised in the tough Brooklyn neighborhood of Beffert Stuyvesant. But right now, only two years after the assassination of Martin Luther King, his publishing empire is just getting started. Graves' dedication to the civil rights movement will provide much of his drive and determination to carve new business inroads for black Americans. Having served as a volunteer for the campaign of President Lyndon B. Johnson as an administrative assistant for Senator Robert F. Kennedy and on the advisory board of the Small Business Administration, he also cultivated a unique understanding of American politics and business. These experiences and insights will serve him well as he turns a relatively small startup loan from the government into a family business that generates tens of millions in revenue annually for decades to come. The WGPR Museum opens on Martin Luther King Day. Joining me now are Joe Spencer and Karen Hudson Samuels from the WGPR TV Historical Society, along with Ken Hollowell of the International Masons, which own WGPR TV. Guys, welcome to American Black Journal. Hello. Thank you, Steve. Oh, yeah. so, so Joe and Karen, uh, I feel like I've had you here several times already to talk about the, the plans for this yeah. museum and the idea. Now we're just a few weeks away from it actually opening. That's really, that's really exciting. Well, we're glad to be back for the big reveal yeah. on Martin Luther King Day. And it was almost a year ago to the date on MLK Day uh, 2016. Uh -huh that we unveiled a historical marker on the station. Right, I remember that. And so now we've got the, the museum and the video that you just showed, that's p part of a historical timeline. And people, there's an interactive monitor that'll allow people to see key events all along that timeline, yeah. GPR and uh, what's happening nationally. So this is real exciting. Yeah, yeah well last year of course this time, we were getting ready to open at the Detroit Historical Museum. Uh, right, right, right. So now a year later, I mean, it's, it's just almost unbelievable <laughs> that we are actually going into a permanent 
home for the museum. And, and for those who may have visited the uh, Detroit Historical Museum, yeah. you're going to see a much bigger and better exhibit. In that I, it sounds museum. like, I mean, it sounds like this is a full-on museum, not just a part of, it is. Uh, of another museum. It is. And it's going to be a growing museum. It's yeah. going to grow and expand. But uh, we've taken a lot of what we had there in the, the Historical Museum and expanded on it. So yeah. it's, going to, it's a terrific very colorful. Uh, yeah. uh, Ken, for those uh, who are watching who maybe are not old enough uh, to remember <laughs> <laughs> WGPR, I am one of the people who is old enough. I grew up right in that neighborhood and uh, near East Jefferson, so I remember that station being there uh, really well. But, but talk about how the station got started and, and sort of the importance of uh, this station as opposed to other stations. Yeah, well, to begin with, Steve, I think it's important to understanding that uh, as was stated earlier, uh, this is a radio station that is owned and operated by a relatively young uh, Masonic fraternity. Uh, International Masons established in 1950. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Banks, being the visionary that he was, uh, initially started uh, WGPR FM radio, which had the pleasure of being the first African owned, African American owned FM radio station right, right. for the state. Uh, that was located in the city of Detroit. And then uh, following his, his vision, uh, he decided he wanted to foray into television. And he had the, the fortunate opportunity to meet with uh, then President Nixon. And uh, in collaboration with then uh, director of the FCC, ben, uh, Benjamin Hooks, uh, they were able to uh, arrange for yeah. for the establishment of the radio uh, the TV station and uh, our supreme current supreme president uh, James O Dogan and our members of our supreme board of directors and our members throughout the United States and the Caribbean are very proud of the opportunity to have provided these media opportunities in the city of Detroit right. as well as now opening up the museum to chronicle not only the historic achievements of Dr. Banks and International Masons, but the development of the radio and TV station and how it interacts with other African American owned media yeah. institutions uh, in this country. Yeah, yeah, and that's a big part of the museum, right? Mm -hmm. Is focusing yes. on, on how that works. Uh, th this is at a time, though, when African Americans, and it's hard to, for some people to even remember this. African Americans weren't really on TV uh, at this point on the other stations that existed in Detroit. Well, that's true, and I think even nationally, uh, there was a period of time, and we have it on our timeline, when African Americans first appeared on national TV, mm -hmm. but on local television in terms of anchors and um, reporters and having the perspective of our stories told from the, the point of view of the African American community, that was something that uh, we have one panel devoted to the cable and internet revolution. Mm -hmm. That has enabled a much broader sure. expansion, but when you get to local TV stations and having that perspective, uh, this will be an education. Yeah. 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 It, it, really, it really started uh, following the 1967 disturbances. Uh, right. Uh, when uh, it was decided uh, that the, uh, well, the FCC decided that uh, the TV stations and radio stations should have a better reflection of the communities that they serve. And that's what started the, the movement toward getting African Americans mm -hmm. on TVs to reflect the communities. And so uh, Dr. Banks was really ahead of everyone else in terms of not only, you know, the whole idea of getting us on TV, but owning TV. Right. Uh, and managing and, and, it. And managing it and, and just bringing all, you know, people from all sorts of walks of life into the media of, of television. And this became an important part of the community. Oh, absolutely. Uh, beyond just media. Uh, WGPR was a big part of the African American community here in Detroit. Yeah, it gave a lot of exposure to a lot of uh, organizations, a lot of people, a lot of ideas. Um, and then not just African American, it should be mm -hmm. understood as well. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ethnic programs, you know, the Arab community had programming on it, Polish community, um, Greek community had programs on it, and you know, just a whole uh, variety of programming. And for 20 years, we were the heartbeat of Detroit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. And I think another important thing that uh, we should recognize is uh, WGPR TV 62 in Detroit gave many African Americans a springboard Their start. to move yeah. into 
some of the major markets around the country and currently there throughout the United States we have former alumni of WGPR who are in high profile positions in the media. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and locally here in Detroit, even uh, someone like Amir Makeupson, who, if you grew up here in the 70s and 80s, you remember her being on Channel 50 later. Uh, yes. But she she got her start at absolutely at PR. And let's not forget uh, Daphne Hughes. Daphne Scott Hughes, your own producer, producer this right, show. Right, right, yeah, right, right, I don't exactly. want to leave her out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's <laughs> one of the shining stars to come out of the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's behind the scenes that's important too. So we we devote some time to that. People sometimes don't realize that the talent they see on air, there are many people behind yeah, the scenes. Right. This is not uh, a right. magic show, right? Not a There's magic a lot show, of people right. doing a lot well, of different things, things to make this look and feel the way it does. Right. And, and that allowed a lot of additional opportunity for people to say they could be producers and directors and then move on once they gained the skill. And I think Dr. Banks very much wanted to bring young people on and give them that opportunity. Yeah. It was truly like Mr. Hollowell said, a springboard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the day that this opens, uh, I would imagine you're going to have a pretty big crowd there. Uh, I might be among them uh, to see it. But but talk about the, some of the things that, that people will see. We saw the the, the film there. But uh, what, what what kind of experience will the museum be? Well, there, there are a couple of things. Uh, you mentioned the interactive component, yeah. which is important. We also have two new panels that were not on display uh, at the Historical Museum, one devoted to the media moguls uh, here in Detroit, uh -huh. uh, actually around the country, and also media personalities uh, from radio, print, and TV who were prominent um, in the market, and we felt were very much deserving of recognition for their career accomplishments. Yeah. And so we've covered a lot of different people in that category. Yeah. In those categories. I'd ju just like to add <coughs> that one of the things that we thought when we decided that we were going to expand the museum was that we should open it up not just to the story of WGPR, but the story of broadcasting here in this community uh -huh. and in, in the broader picture as well. You know, and, and so we've, we've really worked hard at doing that and, and see that you know, it could have a much broader reach by reaching out to you know, some of the very famous people who've come out of media that didn't necessarily have an association with WGPR, but definitely had an impact on our community. Right. Martha right. Jean sure. Queens, yeah. Don Bartons, sure. uh, the Wade Butterball Briggs, mm -hmm. those kinds of people who have had a significant impact on our community, yeah. you know, and the, you know, the other people at 2, 4, and 7, other TV stations. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. So I, I've got you guys here. I would not be... Uh, it would not be a complete interview if I didn't ask about my favorite WGPR show, The Scene, and where it shows up in the museum. <laughs> well, The Scene, and, and I, I do recall on our last visit here, there was a confession you made, which yes. you'd like to perhaps share again. Yeah, I was on The Scene once when I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> We're still waiting for that video I was going to say, I don't think the footage has surfaced. Uh, but we have... Um, you know, there were three very popular dance shows. Yeah. The first was The Scene with Nat Morris. Right. Uh, and we have video that's uh, from that era and uh, some out outfits of Nat Morris. But people will see <laughs> The Scene, the new dance show. And Contempo. And Contempo. And Contempo, and right. And Contempo. That was, I forgot about Contempo. Contempo, those right. were three shows. Yeah. And so, you know, there's an area devoted to that. And what's also unique, the museum is in the original studio of WGPR. Of WGPR, okay. Yeah. Uh, and much like you have Motown, yeah. where it all happened, where they all did we it thought it was important to leverage the actual studios as the key space. And so there's a large studio and our media center will start to expand into um, in our smaller studio and other space as well. So there'll be a lot of exciting things to yeah. see for, for people to come out. Yeah, very yeah It's been very exciting uh, preparing the space. The space hadn't been used for a number of years. Right. So you can imagine uh, what it looked like at that point. So <laughs> we had a major transformation in the space in order to make it uh, something that could accommodate yeah. a museum and have the aesthetics that would, would make a person feel comfortable right. as they were viewing. Right, it. right. <laughs> yeah. All right, right there on East Jefferson. Right, right there on East Jefferson. And I have to say the International Masons have been wonderful our benefactors and supporters. And supporting the museum. All right, the way right, through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we could not have come to this point in time without their support. And uh, we're going to reach out to the community to, to get on board, much as the Masons have, as yeah. we move forward. Okay. All right. Congratulations on the museum open, and thanks for being here. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Steve.
All right, coming up next, uh, an organization that helps young fathers engage with their children. But first, here's a look back at one of the historic interviews that took place on this program in the year 2000. Do we really need to continue at this point in our history as African Americans, as full American citizens, continue to speculate on and fight for enforcement of civil rights? Well, civil rights has been going through a transition, as you suggest. Uh, but to me, it's moving into the era of human rights. Uh, because once you make the separations between de jure and de facto segregation, that that is put in place by law and that is, that is by custom and practice, then you begin to uh, move into wider areas. And I think the entire civil rights movement is thinking about the, the movement that we're making. Now, putting it with the year 2000, uh, the whole country is going through another transition of its own. Uh, we're, we're deciding right now whether or not we're going to allow the clock to be turned back on some of the civil rights gains. Uh, it's no secret that I viewed uh, two reconstructions in our history. Uh, that of uh, uh, 18, six, after 1865, but that that came in 1964 and 1965 with the Civil Rights Act and the Voter Rights Act, which really redefined of necessity. Now we have the Constitution, we have the Bill of Rights, we have all of the amendments, 13, 14, 15, mm -hmm. but we still weren't getting there. Uh, African Americans, in terms of political progress, voter participation, de facto segregation, we were still surrounded with many challenges that had not been resolved during the era of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Congressman John Conyers talking about things in the year 2000 that he might be able to say and be true today. Uh, young Fathers Standing United is a nonprofit organization that supports and educates young men on how to strengthen their bond with their children. The Young Fathers learn how to be more responsible, committed, and involved in their children's lives. And now the organization has started monthly support groups for fathers of all ages. Joining me is the founder, Quanta Fish, along with director Mike Allen, who is leading the new support group. Thanks, both of you, for being here. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful idea, first of all. Uh, but one thing I think we should make clear up front is uh, there's a lot of stereotypes about fathers, and black fathers in particular, about how we aren't involved or how we're not doing for our kids. That's not what your message is here at all. It is about sort of building on what's already taking and place. And that's right. And in fact, uh, a study just came out with the Center for De uh, Control that. and Disease. Yeah. And, uh, and black fathers are actually leading <laughs> in a right. lot of different uh, categories. Among the most involved. That's uh, right. Parents. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. So uh, this time we debunked the myth and, uh, and, and actually get these fathers inspired because I think they're starting to believe uh, what the what the what the society is saying is, is telling them that that's they're, right that they're not doing it exactly yeah so talk about what the new support group is is focusing on well we want to get men involved you know women tend to come together and support each other and mm -hmm. sisters <laughs> so we need to get the brothers together yeah. you know um, so so our mission now is to call all men we're trying to to combine the young men with the older men. Mm -hmm. that's right. Great idea, by the way, because yeah. uh, that draws those connections out over time. Absolutely. You know, they did it uh, before. Now you sort of pass it on to the younger. Well, generation. we're in a new we're in a new, we're in a new age, technology age. You know, I come from the industrial age. <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> right. And so we need each other. Right. You know, I need these guys to help me, and they need us, mm -hmm. so that we can teach them the things that that we've learned. Yeah. That's right. You yeah. know, over time. Yeah. Well, you know, to, to add to what he said, uh, you know, we really want to, uh, first of all, break the stereotype and the fears that we have among each other as black men. So, uh, you know, a lot of the older men are scared of the young guys, and a lot of the young guys don't respect the older yeah. men. Wow. So I want to create a platform to bring the two together and uh, 
you know, and naturally learn from each other. We all been through something, you right. know. So I don't have all the answers, like, but all together we had the answers. So yeah, yeah. Yes. You know, one of the things that that uh, I find is <coughs> is difficult to talk to when you're talking to young people who are just getting into parenting, is the idea that uh, that if you make a mistake that somehow that sets you on a path that you can't get back on, right? right? That, that, that there are such things as fatal mistakes right. as parents. But of course, you're a parent your whole, you know, the whole life once, uh, once, you're, once that happens to you. And that's right. there are always opportunities to go back and do better or do differently. Yeah, uh, that's right. I feel like that's one of the messages that gets lost. With, yes, uh, yes. People. Well, you know, I got this, this, this saying that, um, you you, you got to you got to get back on your road. Mm -hmm. Every every young man has their own road, you know. So when you make a mistake, you got to get back on your road, so that you can continue your journey. Right. We all make mistakes. Yes. Yeah, right. You know, but you can't you can't travel down somebody else's road, and try to be successful because it's just not meant for you. Right. You got to right. find out what's meant <laughs> what's for works you. What's for you? Yeah. And then stay right. on your path, as yeah. they say, stay in your lane. Yeah. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so, what are some of the things you guys hear from the young fathers in particular? Are the ones I'm I'm really curious about because yeah. uh, they're new at it. And yeah. Uh, what, what are some of the things they talk about that they don't quite get? Well, you know, it always comes back to uh, employment. Um, of course, they never had fathers themselves, so they lack a the skill. Yeah. You can't impart what you don't possess. Um, and I think it's self-confidence, you know. They, can't, they don't believe that they had a skill. They don't even believe that they're important enough to, uh, to impact that child's life. They mm -hmm. think it's all about mom and I'm going to go over here and get myself together. But at the end of the day, your child's suffering. Yeah. So, you know, statistics tell us otherwise that, you know, dads are super important to the development of their children. Yeah. And so uh, I just want to build the confidence of these young brothers and, uh, and bring some older seasoned dads on board. And, uh, and, and, and we get engaged in the community and, uh, and we get engaged in our children's lives. Yes, sir. So we, already, we have uh, annual events already put together. Uh -huh. We have an uh, annual picnic. Um, that we do with the uh, with Warren C. Evans, okay. Wayne County Executive. Yeah. This would be our third year partnering with him, um, and so yeah, we want to get the guys just in the community and, and and let the other fathers see us doing what we do, and hopefully it can become contagious. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, is the goal here? Uh, ultimately, to, to 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 bring in women and mothers uh, at some point too, well, to to try to to try to sort of mend those bonds too, because a lot of times that's a barrier to parenting, right? Yes. That you're not with uh, the, the the child's mother. Open okay. that line of communication. And yeah. so those are the kind of conversations that we had with these dads. Like, uh, we we start off, we have an open group discussion where we just get everything off our chest. Yeah. We we break bread, mm -hmm. and then we learn a skill. So, uh, so the whole piece is, you know, we, we talk about the domestic violence piece. We talk about the importance of, 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 of having a good relationship, which that goes along with uh, raising a healthy child. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, so uh, the, you know, it's a challenge because moms are on another page. Right. So, <laughs> so, so their own <laughs> challenges, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. exactly. So, um, so somehow we got to find a way to implement the mothers. But our main goal is to you know, to reinforce the skills of these of these men and the self-confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. And a lot of what you're doing is building, uh, I don't want to say character, but you're building just sort of male character. That's right. I mean, it's not just fathers uh, or just about being a father. It's the idea of taking responsibility and being committed. Those are, yes. those are just things that all men need to think a little more you're about. Right. And it's a lot of misconceptions as it relates to uh, masculinity, mm -hmm. you know, so it's all over the place. Everybody have a different interpretation yeah. of what that looked like. So that's definitely one of the main pieces that that we want to incorporate because you can't be a good father until you're a good man. Yeah. So <laughs> right, so, that's right. Those so two yeah, things go together. That's right. right. And yeah. so what we lack in the most is principles. Every household has different principles. So uh, that's what I want to do with the group. We're gonna we're gonna standardize some principles. <laughs> this is what the group is about. This yeah. is the characteristics of the group. And then we're gonna expand that, and uh, and so we, it's so much, so many things we could do as as a team, because you know uh, we can affect policy. We right. can, you know, right. we can affect the child support system. You know what I mean? We can find out who are the judges that's 
that's disrespecting the dads, and, and, and you know what I mean? We don't know that if we ain't together. Right. So let's find out, and then, then we're going to use our voting power. Yeah, right. So that, that's the ultimate goal. Uh -huh. So we just want to send yeah. a call out to all men. Yeah. That's right. To, 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 get to, come, to come aboard. Yeah. You know. okay. Every yeah. second I wish, Saturday. Uh, I wish we could keep talking. Every second Saturday. <laughs> Every second we'll Saturday. We'll put the information uh, up. Uh, the 14th, uh, which is next week, uh -huh. meet us at the Matrix Center, and that's going to be 13560 East McNichols. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you guys for being here. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org, and you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television.